Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. My name is uh, Alain Cardiou. I'm a professor of intensive care working in Paris in, in France. And the topic we discussed today is a cardiogenic shock, but specifically after cardiac arrest. These are my conflict of uh, interest related to this presentation. And uh, uh, in order to introduce, uh, let me just uh, remind that uh, the, the outcome after cardiac arrest is still very bad with, with a lot of these patients, uh, unfortunately, dying during the first days in the ICU, even after being admitted with a stable return of spontaneous circulation. Most of these patients will uh, unfortunately die from brain injury consecutive to uh, cardiac arrest. But in, in the very first thousand days, the mortality is mostly related to what is commonly called post-resuscitation uh, post shock. And uh, uh, this uh, circulatory failure that is very common in these patients, we estimate at that time that uh, about uh, between 50 and 70 percent of these patients will present uh, severe arterial hypotension during the, the post-resuscitation period. You can see here that this uh, hypertension is associated with a worse outcome, mostly because probably, uh, of course, this uh, circulatory dysfunction will lead to uh, uh, organ dysfunction, such as acute renal failure or coagulopathy, liver failure, et cetera, et cetera, and then death in most of these patients. It means that it's not so trivial because uh, we estimate that uh, about 20% of patients who are admitted after ROSC in ICU after cardiac arrest will die before any brain elevation, even before any neurological uh, prognostication possibility from this uh, circulatory dysfunction, both resuscitation shock and multiple organ failure. The, Pathophysiology of this uh, post-resuscitation shock is very complex uh, with an association of uh, systemic inflammatory response, coronary occlusion, of course, but one of the most important determinants is myocardial dysfunction. This post-resuscitation myocardial dysfunction is something well known. As you can see, uh, using echocardiography in a series of patients in whom it was uh, uh, possible to, uh, to, to obtain, to know the previous ejection fraction previous to the cardiac arrest, you can see that after cardiac arrest, there is a huge and deep and severe uh, decrease in ejection fraction, which will possibly, probably in, in the following days uh, progressively recover in most of these survivors. It means that in the post-cardiac arrest period, there is a severe myocardial dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, uh, which will recover in, in the following days. It is very important to remind that even when uh, using the, uh, the recent Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention stage level for cardiogenic shock, uh, when you use this uh, classification, you, you can see that uh, in, as compared with patients without cardiac arrest, in blue, uh, patients with, in red here, it's a, a report from the Mayo Clinic, a large uh, series of patients from the Mayo Clinic, you can see that uh, at whatever the level, uh, the stage level of the cardiogenic shock, patients with uh, previous cardiac arrest with an associated cardiac arrest, with a cardiac arrest as the motor of the cardiogenic shock are uh, associated with a very, very bad outcome. And it's, it is not only the early uh, prognosis that is uh, affected by the cardiac arrest and, and its association with, a, with the cardiogenic shock, but also you can see uh, the long-term all-cause mortality and major adverse cardiac events are also that much more frequent in this population. So, the cardiogenic shock associated with uh, a cardiac arrest is something associated with a very bad outcome, not only at the very early period, but also for the long-term period. Pathophysiology is, of course, uh, uh, associated with the cause, but not only what was done during the resuscitation is also something that affects the severity of the myocardial dysfunction. We know, coming from animal experience, that the defibrillation attempts uh, epinephrine dosage that were used during resuscitation are something associated with the severity of the myocardial dysfunction. And this was also observed in humans. Uh, coming back to this uh, landmark study from uh, Yvan Laurent, uh, nearly uh, 20 years ago, 
we can see here that the variables that were found to be associated with a higher risk of developing a, a cardiogenic shock, a post resuscitation shock in these post resuscitated patients, where the duration of the, the CPR, of course, the longer, the, the worse, the number of defibrillation, and also the total dose of epinephrine that was used. And of course, uh, uh, if uh, there was a coronary cause as the cause of uh, coronary occlusion as the cause of the arrest, this was also something that was associated with higher risk of developing a post resuscitation shock. Of course, uh, this, uh, this is very important to remind that uh, if there is a coronary occlusion, as the cause of the arrest, this is something, of course, associated with a, a higher risk of myocardial dysfunction. And this is probably why in, in most of uh, uh, studies that were uh, depicted in the recent years, uh, being able to perform a, a coronary a PCI at the very early stage after cardiac arrest, when there is a coronary obstruction as the cause of the arrest, is associated with a clear benefit in these patients. And in the most severe patients, the best benefit would be obtained if it is possible to combine the early coronary perfusion with a temporary mechanical circulatory assistance. It means that in these very severe patients, it is possible to obtain a good outcome. You can see, looking at the series from Minneapolis, reported by Yanopoulos some years ago, that uh, it, it, would, it, yeah, it has been possible to obtain a, a nearly 50% uh, survival rate in this very severe patient with a cardiac arrest outside of the hospital, a coronary obstruction, and a severe uh, circulatory dysfunction by using the combination of early reperfusion and uh, ECMO in these patients. Uh, very important and very specific to these patients regarding the post resuscitation dysfunction is the very important inflammatory response that is observed in these patients. That's why it is common to use the term of uh, septic shock syndrome in these patients because uh, it shares a lot of uh, clinical and biological uh, patterns with septic shock, such as uh, coagulopathy, circulatory failure with vasoplegia. This uh, vasoplegia is something very important and probably much more important that one that as compared uh, with what is observed is um, even in, in very severe ischemic cardiogenic shock. Recent uh, data uh, uh, were very important because it, 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 at that time, the, the most uh, common hypothesis for to explain this uh, circulatory systemic inflammation is uh, what is called the Splunknik uh, hypothesis, uh, meaning that uh, the ischemia or reperfusion is of course uh, global but may uh, uh, particularly affect the splanchnic uh, circulatory dysfunction, which uh, is responsible for a huge release of uh, endotoxin in the systemic circulation, which is also associated with circulatory dysfunction. This has been uh, well depicted by uh, David Grimaldi five years ago, uh, and it was shown in this uh, series of post-cardiac arrest patients that uh, the, the, the amount of uh, cytokines, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and mostly endotoxin that were released in this situation, that the, the, the larger uh, amount of uh, cytokines is associated with uh, uh, the highest risk of circulatory dysfunction, meaning that uh, the severity of the resuscitation, the duration of the arrest is so associated with the very important ischemia perfusion of the splunctic uh, circulatory a region and is associated with a higher risk of circulatory dysfunction. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of uh, treatment opportunities uh, in the, in, to, to contract this uh, systemic inflammatory uh, dysfunction. We uh, tried for some years to use uh, epurative uh, 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 treatments such as uh, hemodialysis with high curl of membrane. And uh, in this uh, treatment, which is uh, uh, hypothetically uh, uh, able to remove from the circulation, from the plasma, the, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then uh, could be associated with the circulatory benefit. Uh, even when, when we test this uh, system, we did not observe any clinical benefit. Uh, what, whatever the, the endpoint, uh, you can observe here that we, we did not observe uh, an, uh, an improvement in the hemodynamic pattern in these patients as compared with control. And uh, of course, we did not observe any uh, an important benefit regarding the, the outcome. Last but 
not least. In, in this post cardiac arrest patients, uh, treating the, the circulatory dysfunction is uh, something very important for the, the brain neural protection. Because in these patients, as, as we said before, the, the most important uh, determinant of outcome is, of course, brain injury. And if you are not able to control the circulation, it will be associated, of course, with the worsening in, in the brain circulation and in brain injuries that can be observed in these patients. And as you know, we mostly use the only treatment that has been demonstrated to be efficient in these patients. We mostly use uh, targeted temperature management. And at that time, it is difficult to know uh, what would be the, the best level for the targeted temperature to be used in this situation if the patient is not only comatose, but also affected with a severe circulatory dysfunction or cardiogenic shock. We do not know if uh, using uh, 33, 34, 35 would be associated with a, a less detrimental effect or, or a best uh, opportunity for circulatory dysfunction. Uh, we probably, we, we observed in the TTM1 that there is no huge difference, but as you can see, as compared with uh, 33, using 36, we was associated with maybe a less detrimental circulatory uh, effect. Uh, meaning that the mean arterial pressure was a little bit higher over time during the treatment and uh, that uh, there, there was also a, a, a lower decrease, a, a more rapid decrease in lactate in, the, in patients with uh, 36. Anyway, at that time, uh, it, it is difficult to know if we should use uh, uh, one of these targeted uh, level of temperature or another one in order to protect the, the, the circulatory dysfunction and we, we will probably need to, to wait. So my take home messages are uh, very simple. The post resuscitation shock is something very common and is responsible for many early deaths in these patients. And this is the resultant of a complex pathophysiology with a post-cardiac uh, post arrest myocardial dysfunction, as I said before, probably a severe uh, peripheral uh, splanchnic uh, ischemia reperfusion uh, that is associated with a systemic inflammation. And uh, as said also before, at that time, we mostly use supportive treatments and we are uh, clearly in, in need for very specific treatment in these patients. Thank you very much.